is that Jim feels the hesitation that he does. What I want to do now is to introduce you to the third of the main moral outlooks that we're going to consider this semester. So last lecture, we looked very carefully at consequentialist moral theories in the form of John Stuart Mill. And those are theories which locate the moral value of an act in its consequences. In the first part of the class, we spent a lot of time looking at Aristotle's virtue theory, which located the moral worth of an act in the actor. Remember, we looked at acts having moral worth only if they are done as the result of a sort of constancy of character. What we're going to look at today is the third piece of this story of a moral view that says the morality attached to an action is not the result of what the actor is like. It's not the result of what the consequences are like. Rather, it is about the act itself. In particular, we're going to look at the deontological theory of Immanuel Kant. So, Immanuel Kant was an 18th century German philosopher who, like Plato and Aristotle, provided a comprehensive and systematic philosophical theory that to this day is taken seriously as one of the ways one might make sense of the world as a whole. Kant has theories of metaphysics, that is, what kind of stuff there is, he has theories of epistemology, that is, how we know about what kind of stuff there is. He has theories of ethics, what the right thing to do is. And he has theories of aesthetics, that is, what gives things aesthetic value. Famously, Kant articulated his views about these three major domains of philosophy in three enormous and dense books. The first, The Critique of Pure Reason, which told you about what the world is like and how we know it to be that way, which he wrote first in 1781 and then revised. The second, The Critique of Practical Reason, which is an account of the nature of morality. And the third, The Critique of Judgment, which is an account of the nature of aesthetic value. But in addition to those dense works, Kant also wrote what he took to be more popular presentations of his view. In the case of metaphysics, he wrote a book called The Prolegomena to Any Future Metaphysics. And in the case of ethics, he wrote something that he calls the grounding for the metaphysics of morals, which is, of course, the work from which we read excerpts for today. So I give you this context because I want you to know that as hard as the reading that we did from Kant was, I chose for you perhaps the easiest part of the easiest book that he wrote. So what should you take home from Kant if you take home nothing else? If you take home nothing else from a reading of Kant, I want you to take home Kant's idea of the categorical imperative. And my goal in the remainder of lecture today is to bring you, by reading through with you the text of Kant that we had today, to a point where you will be well positioned to understand what Kant means by the categorical imperative. And depending on how the next 20 minutes go, we'll get to that either right at the end of today's lecture or right at the beginning of Thursday's. Uh, sorry, of, yes, of Thursday's. OK, so Kant's text, the groundwork or grounding for the metaphysics of morals, begins with a very famous passage where Kant says, nothing can be regarded as good without qualification except the good will. This claim should be familiar with, to you, O oh readers of Book Two of Plato's Republic. This is the classic distinction between things that have intrinsic value 
and things that are merely of instrumental worth. And indeed, much in the way that Plato's Socrates does, Kant goes on to enumerate some things which fall into the other category, the category of things that are of mere instrumental utility. Among the things that cannot be regarded as good without qualification, says Kant, are talents of the mind, like intelligence and wit, qualities of temperament, like courage and perseverance, gifts of fortune, like power and riches and honor and health. And, he says, taking a direct jibe at Aristotle and noting as such that he is so doing, neither can the ancient virtues, oh my goodness, of, how do I close that email? Neither can the ancient virtues of moderation and self-control be considered as good in themselves. Why? Because though being intelligent or brave or rich or controlled will help you to achieve the goals that you have, they don't determine what those goals might be. They magnify your effectiveness as an agent, but they don't determine the valence, the value of your agency. So says Kant, a witty persevering, rich, healthy, moderate thief will be an outstanding thief, but that doesn't make his thiefdom good. Each of the virtues that has traditionally been extolled as a virtue, says Kant, gains its value only insofar as the goodwill is part of it. Now, a good will, says Kant, is good not because of what it affects or accomplishes. It's good in itself. When I say that Kant is a critic of consequentialism, I am not exaggerating. Kant doesn't think that the outcome of the act is what matters. And in an extraordinarily famous passage, famous in part because of the rather shocking translation which has come down to us of it, Kant says, the good will would remain good even if by the niggardly provision of stepmotherly nature, it wholly lacked the power to accomplish its pur purpose. By which he means, even if you, with your goodwill, were frustrated in all of the goals that you set out to achieve, your actions would still have moral worth, and somewhat more poetically and a bit less uh, in a vocabulary that is challenging to the modern ear, Kant says, even if it didn't achieve its outcomes, it would like a jewel still shine by its own light as something which has full value in itself, its usefulness or fruitlessness can neither augment nor diminish its value. Now the question is this, how could anybody come to have this view? How could anybody have a view of morality that says what matters for an act to be moral is not the outcome that it produces, but rather the description under which the act is done. What I want to try to do right now is to put you inside the Kantian picture so that you get a sense of what that worldview looks like. So in the passages that we read for today, Kant makes three particular claims. He says that an action must be done from duty in order to have moral worth. So the first notion that I want to try to explicate for you is the Kantian notion of something being done from duty. An action done from duty, says Kant in his second proposition, has its moral worth not in the purpose that is to be attained by it, but in the maxim according to which the action is 
determined. So the way that an action done from duty has moral worth is not by looking to see what outcome you're expecting from it, but rather by looking to see under what characterization did you perform the act. And again, I'll spell out what each of those terms mean. Finally, says Kant, duty, which lies at the heart of deontological moral theory, Duty is the necessity of an action done out of the respect for the law. Kant believes that it is only when you subject your will to a law which you have made for yourself, that is, the moral law whose binding force upon you you have recognized, it is only in that circumstance that you are truly free. So Kant says duty is the necessity of an action done out of the respect for the law. And when you perform an action out of respect for the moral law, says Kant, then and only then do you act autonomously. OK, so three incredibly complicated, subtle claims from Kant. Let's try getting to the bottom of what they mean. So let's start with the first claim, the claim that an act has moral worth only when it is done from duty. So Kant points out that there's three kinds of motivation that we might have in performing an act. We might do an act out of duty, we might do it out of inclination, or we might do it out of self-interest. Only cases of the first kind, in fact, only pure cases of the first kind, have moral worth. Actions that are done merely in keeping with, but not from moral duty, have no moral worth, according to Kant. So if you obey the law, but you do so only out of self-interest, your obedience, says Kant, has no moral worth. If you rescue the drowning child from the pond, but you do so only because there's a sign on the tree that says, rescue drowning children, one million dollar reward, your act has no moral worth. So we can think about what Kant's claim amounts to and how it differs from the other ones that we've been looking at by thinking of the question space in terms of a flow chart. So we're trying to decide whether a particular action has moral worth. And the first thing we want to ask ourselves is, does the action accord with duty? If the answer to that is no, that is, if you've done something like lied, or stolen something, or murdered somebody, or uh, allowed something terrible to happen in front of you that you could have easily, at no cost to yourself, present, prevented, all of the authors that we've read unsurprisingly say that the act has no moral worth. Oh, so did that just disappear? That was supposed to be in red on black. Is it completely invisible from the back? Oh, well, that's a pity. Okay, so uh, what that says in red uh, is no lying and stealing, but it's in red. I, it, I can't change it in the middle of the slides, but uh, I'll remind you what those things say. Okay, the second question that we ask, having eliminated now from the realm of morally worthy acts those that don't accord with duty, is what motive the act was done with. So perhaps you act in a morally worthy way, out of self-interest, without immediate inclination. So you pay your taxes because if you don't pay your taxes, you're going to have to pay more taxes. You obey the speed limit, but only because you're afraid you might get caught. Otherwise, Mill says those acts have moral worth. Kant says, no, they don't. And again, that's supposed to be in red, but it's now invisible. Suppose that you do an act in such a way that you have an inclination that's in keeping with duty. 
So Kant thinks you have a duty not to commit suicide, and he considers the case where you fail to commit suicide because you're happy. Kant thinks you need to be loyal to your life partner, but he says there's no moral worth to remaining loyal to your life partner while you are in love. There's no moral worth, says Kant, to acting kindly towards somebody when you feel sympathy towards them. Because in those cases, though your act is in keeping with what morality demands, it's not done because it is the right thing to do. You are doing it because your inclination happens to line up with what morality demands of you. Now, Aristotle, of course, took this situation to be the one in which moral worth is paradigmatically expressed. But Kant thinks that in such cases, you cannot tell that an act was done from the moral law. All you can see is that it was done in keeping with the moral law. It, command, it corresponds to what the moral law demands. But we can't see from that that the motive was duty. It's only in the third case, the case where you act from duty without any inclination and without any self-interest, that Kant thinks the moral worth of an action can be seen. If you preserve your life when you feel the inclination to do otherwise, if you act kindly in situations where there's no reward for you and you feel no sympathy, in those cases, says Kant, we can see that the act was done not merely in keeping with, but from the moral law. This isn't to say that Kant doesn't think a life lived in the way that Aristotle's suggested life is lived is a badly lived life. Cases where your inclination happens to line up with duty helpfully keep you out of this box of doing the wrong thing. But they don't allow you to test your character and see of yourself that the motivation that you have for doing the right thing is to conform to what the moral law demands of you. So with that understanding of what it is to act from duty in mind, we're now in a position to make sense of Kant's second claim in our reading for today. That an action done from duty has its moral worth not in the purpose that's to be attained by it, but in the maxim according to which the action is determined. So remember, we've learned that an action done from duty is one that you do in conformity with what morality demands because that is what morality demands. Not because it's in your self-interest, not because you are inclined to behave in that way, but because that act is what morality demands of you. But in order to determine whether an act is what morality demands of you, that act needs to be described in a particular way to you. And the way that you describe that act to yourself makes use of what Kant calls a maxim, a subjective principle of volition, that is, a description of something that is about you, the subject, that says what your desires beha towards behavior are in that situation. A subjective principle of volition, that is, a description under which the act is done. So it takes the form, perhaps, in all engagings with all who come into my shop, I will provide them with an honest accounting of how much their uh, transaction is worth, regardless of whether I could be discovered cheating in this. Or in all of my encounters with those who are weak and in need of my help, I will provide them with the aid that I can, regardless of whether that will be of benefit to me. 
only by considering the motive and not by considering the outcome can the action be expressive of the goodwill itself. The goodwill is the only thing that is good in itself, says Kant. And it's only by looking at the description under which an act is done that we can determine whether the goodwill was implicated in the right way in the choice to perform that action. Third claim. Duty is the necessity of an action done out of the respect for the law. So we know that an act has moral worth only if it's done from duty. We know that in order to be done from duty, it needs to be done under a certain description. And now we're told what it is that this duty amounts to. In order for an act to have been done from duty, says Kant, it must have been done with explicit recognition that what one is doing at that point is respecting the moral law in so far as it articulates what morality demands of you. Not in so far as it articulates ways that you might have a well-ordered, harmonious, happy soul. Not in so far as it articulates ways in which lots of happiness could be spread around to lots of people. Out of respect, rather, says Kant, for the fact that it is what morality demands of you. The moral worth of an act, says Kant, does not lie in its effect. For the effect could have come about in multiple ways. I can set out to release a biological gas in a subway that's intended to kill thousands of people. And because I'm not very good at chemistry, the result could be that I produce an enormous amount of joy in those thousands of people. The effect can come about in lots of ways. Kant says Mill would have to say that in releasing that gas, I have done something with moral worth. Kant says no. What matters is the description under which the act is done, and in particular that that description be that one have respect for the law itself. So I told you I was going to get you to the point of the categorical imperative, and I'm going to end lecture today by bringing you right up to that point, and then next class we'll talk about it in more detail. So the question is this, right? This is a pressing, exciting question in Kant. All right, I realize that we're in the in Kant part of things, but this is really exciting. What sort of law, says Kant, he even puts a but to get you sort of excited, but he says cliffhanger. What sort of law can that be, the thought of which must determine the will without reference to any intent, expected effect, so that the will can be called absolutely good without qualification. It's so exciting. We're finding something that's going to make us genuinely autonomous and free and moral. Well, remember, it can't be anything particular. It can't be anything specific about the world or its outcomes. What can it be? It can be the will's universal conformity of its actions to law as such. That is, what makes the law binding is the fact that it is recognized by all rational agents as binding. In particular, it takes the form of what Kant calls the categorical imperative. And here's the formulation of the categorical imperative that we got in our reading for today. Never act except in such a way that I can also will that my act maxim should become a universal law. Never do anything that you couldn't will everybody else to do at the same time. And we'll begin next lecture with the example that Kant uses to illustrate this, namely the lying promise talk a little bit more about various formulations of the categorical imperative, and then move to Judy Thompson's